Been a while. Hope you enjoyed your summer. Me? Oh, uh, been playing games. Watching Gundam. Been watching uh, a lot of Gundam. Help me. I have a problem. Oh, wait, that's a lie. I just rewatched Mad Bull 34. Wait, this girl's gone into shock. She's frozen up, but she won't let go of me. She'll thaw out if you stick your finger up her ass. What? Yeah, I've been watching a lot of that anime. Guess that means nothing new from Catherine then, huh? <laughs> Aw, isn't he cute? Yeah. Really cute. Catherine is yet another spin-off of Shimagami Tensei, with its roots more intimately embedded within Persona. Okay, that might be an overstatement. You know, I tried to give Persona 3 a shot on several occasions, but I'm... Uh, I'm far from writing it off. It's got a strong sense of style and some pretty damn well-written characters, but it's hard for me to get invested in a school setting where you're grinding social links by day and Tartarus by night, yet you need to get your ass back to bed because you got a lab due first period, your bud needs advice on plowing his own teacher, and the prom's tomorrow! Uh, well, you know, that means the only solution left is to play a real Shin Megumi Tensei. See, now this I could take seriously. Hanging out with friends, playing arcade games, adultery with a demon, gossiping like a child, real grown-up shit. Do you want a feast for the eyes? Do you want a feast for the ears? Do you want to eat with anything besides your fat fucking mouth? Well, you came to the right place. Marvel, as you're forced to watch a 32-year-old man shift uncomfortably in his seat, as a lovable cast of ultras pick him apart while they stare at him like an out-of-place foot gag in a Dan Schneider production in this first ever interactive midlife crisis. It might not be the first. Catherine is one of those games that I notice most people tend to admire from a distance, but when I ask them what they thought, it's mostly, ugh, it's too hard, I gave up around the ice stage. Or, eh, I'd play the damn thing if it wasn't a puzzle game. Given that Atlas has a history of underestimating their challenge grading, easy is normal and normal is hard, can't really say I blame them. Go figure, my fragile ego always sent me through the grinder, but maybe that's thematic. To the surprise of no one, the game doesn't take it easy on Vincent Brooks. Each night, over the course of a week and some change, he's beckoned into a Euclidean nightmare. Chased by his fears, magnified, he's tasked to climb an enormous pain in the ass just to earn the right to suffer for one more day. Because yeah, if you die here, you're done. With the sounds of Bach or Holst or Razzini erupting in gorgeously remixed compositions, your blood is set on fire, clawing your way upward as the floor falls out from beneath you. That's your timer, by the way. And oh hey, fancy that, a variety of block types that lie ahead of you that will control the pace at which you proceed. You'll constantly be forced to adapt and rethink the way you'll path forward or back, from activating one-time traps to ensuring you don't make waste of a crumbling block, or planning out how you'll shimmy and slide across ice is all woven seamlessly with the various techniques you'll pick up on from one landing to the next. Eventually bombs become do or don't hazards that are sometimes left to best ejected entirely from the equation. Couple that with the power-ups you can grab that have been scattered throughout the stage or you can pick up from this fat fuck, at the risk of damaging your own score potential and... <sighs> what's that? All these systems can be used to complement one another and multiply your possibilities rather than bypass the challenge completely. Not a single element leads to a dead-end system, leading you to ponder, why even bother? <laughs> Hold on. I need to cool off with a nice, cool drink or three that increases my speed when I get to my nightmares? What? I know this is sudden. But here is some trivia about Japanese sake. Uh, okay, calm down, weeb. Even after I beat the game a fair few times back in 2011, I continued to echo the opinion that the game wasn't really my thing, and that I was just kind of in it for the story. I saw it through to several endings, True Cheater being my favorite of the bunch, and left it at that. Years later, I thought it would be the same song and dance, but I was wrong. I can't quite explain it, but this time something just clicked. I was suddenly having fun. It might have been delayed for the greater half of a decade, but delayed appreciation is appreciation nonetheless. I guess. Adapting to a living block's movement on the fly, or manipulating enemy AI to lure them into setting off a trap block or turn a crumbling block to dust, while I reap the reward of pursuing an ever-increasing step combo netting me a ridiculous amount of continues, scratched this itch that I hadn't realized was there. You bet your ass I earned the right to run around in my boxers. My return playthrough on PC was predictably littered in bronze trophies, but my follow-up playthrough was a hell of a lot more dignified. And I'll tell you what, I couldn't be happier to net a gold on stage 8 because, truth be told, the only on-point nightmare in the entire game is dealing with Catherine's garbage AI. Excuse me, I'm getting ahead of myself. For as stylized and charming as the nightmare can be, the waking world really lets Shoji Maguro's original music flex and breathe. It's also where the vast majority of Studio 4C's gorgeous 2D animated cutscenes take place. Yeah, the same studio behind Yuasa's mind game. Believe me when I tell you that they bring Shigenori Sojima's characters to life with some brilliant key animation that is to die for. But hey, the game itself is no slouch either. Background drops like the Chrono Rabbit or Kappa Heaven may be fleeting, but they're nevertheless detailed with such minute and careful consideration. The characters, the atmosphere. Catherine's visuals are sublime. The stray sheep is refreshingly cozy in that, kept company by a demonic harlot after one too many Kubelibres kinda... Uh, <laughs> oh, hey! Oh, come on, 
What a waste of a perfectly fine cigarette. And it's a good thing that the stray sheep is so cozy because Vince will be coming back here a lot to forget his day and dwell in his nightmares. Just like every other poor sap. Between those very same nightmares leaving him exhausted by the time he awakes, and his fear of commitment placing a progressively more alienating strain between him and his girlfriend, Catherine, he's left emotionally spent and winds up falling into the seductive trapping of another Catherine's thighs. He's filled with immediate regret the next day, which, if that seems off to you, make no mistake, Vince does genuinely love his girlfriend. But he's not an admirable man. He's a bit of a dick. As are his friends. Getting to know the crew is a treat, roasting included, and a familiar reminder of the company I keep. Flaws and all, they still seek to support and comfort one another in between cannibalizing each other over the smallest detail. Marvel, with the same uncomfortable fascination as you would a car crash as you witness Toby, the youngest and the most impressionable of the circle, struggle to find his own way while the likes of Johnny and Orlando steer his views. The bad influences that they are. The two of them are far from perfect and they're not afraid to remind us. But they each sit in a distinct position opposite of one another, both literally and figuratively in which one will sooner blame himself for his own issues, while the other lashes outward. Vincent's affair inevitably turns up as the central topic between the four of them each day, not only out of concern for him, but Catherine as well. It eventually ropes in the likes of Erica and the boss, making it more people's business than what he's comfortable with. As if Hashino needed to- oh, yeah, I mentioned this is a Hashino game, right? As if Hashino needed to reassure Vincent that he's yet to hit the bottom of the barrel, he can drift from one patron to another, and these people are... Fucked up. It's over the course of time that the depths of their issues come to light, and given the nightmare manifests their fears to exaggerated proportions, it's as if airing where the damage stems from has become a form of comfort. No one's as simple and straightforward as they may seem. It's apparent within moments of finding reprieve at the landing that each sheep he meets is another flesh and blood human. Each and every one of them. But rather than just act as a soundboard for people to rant at, Vincent has the freedom to reciprocate, offering his own advice which can shepherd these individuals along their ever-steepening climb to come out the other side alive. And if the weight of responsibility for their survival sounds anything like one of the more heart-wrenching yet encouraging aspects that I adore about Alundra, that's because it is. Albeit, served in a more tangible fashion as Vince can steer their fate. Those he fails show up on the news, coldly listed as one among the skyrocketing number of mysterious deaths. And much like Alundra, it broke my heart to see such a sight. The first time. The second time I was trying to max out my chaos meter, so uh, whoops. Whether he's aligned more deeply with order or chaos, Vincent's internal monologue will change drastically, shaping his thoughts not only when speaking with friends, but more importantly, with either Catherine. In the very same scene, his mind will either reveal a form of resolve to fix things with his girlfriend because he's certain she's the one for him, or he'll panic and dwell on covering up this mess because it was more trouble than it was worth, leading to who he is on the surface seemingly compatible with his headspace. Bravo. Regardless of the meter, he'll fixate on smoothing things out between him and Catherine. She consistently offers her hand out to him over this period of stress and, as sure as the sun will rise, this plays into Vincent falling back into his greatest sin, complacency at the expense of others. Catherine's outward display of care for Vince isn't just for show, it's her true nature. What I appreciate about that is that she's still imperfect, as even she screws up enough to demonstrate that the foundation of their relationship has grown infertile and is in dire need of mending. It's that touch of realism to a fracturing relationship that needs to be present and speaking of present. Just as he thought he was safe behind several refills of his trust at Cuba Libre, here comes an atomic blonde sauntering in, doing her best Ivy impression with the force of a split atom evaporating his defenses, demonstrating enough soul-crushing efficiency he could get Ivan the Terrible to turn his head in pant and heat. Enter Catherine. <laughs> Enter Catherine. And oh, this tight little firecracker is just the light of his life. The spark to his bulb. The fuel for his fire. No diamond lies too deep which her drills can't reach. Just don't make her mad. Catherine bears the cross of escalation, solely responsible for the story's momentum as we're anchored by increasingly more absurd appearances by her. Morning after morning, the affair goes from easy to buy into before it becomes confusing and bizarre, eventually taking a turn for the impossible to the outright frightening. Vincent's weak torn between the two of them fills his head with fears, which follow him straight into his nightmares. They take the form of a creature driven by murderous intent to stop him from conquering each climb. It's impressive how little overlap there was between each boss fight. Sure, if they can get close enough to Vince, they'll smash him into pink paste. And yeah, sure, they all disregard the normal collapse timer, eviscerating whole chunks of the stage at their own discretion. But one moment Vince is dodging an avalanche, watching blocks being torn out of the stage and thrown at him, before he's then narrowly climbing past autonomous buzzsaws and baiting bullets. Even if it sounds rudimentary, a few bosses can swap the properties of boxes, transforming huge clusters into heavy stone or curse Vincent to cause his own block pulling to trigger all the other special blocks to take on nearly any other property. Of course, it keeps you on your toes and makes you consider how you'll climb, but even better, it once again loops back to those handy dandy special items to counteract these effects. 
Even using the ability to undo will revert these changes depending on just how far back you think you need to go. Though, sometimes the undo ability would lead to a swift and cheap death, teleporting me right into a boss hazard. It was a little difficult to judge if that was on me or not. Hell, even the camera would feel irresponsibly showy at times, drifting off to marvel at the boss and forcing me to waste my time standing still lest I get disoriented and screw myself over. That is not even the only issue with the camera. For whatever reason, it can only tilt so far and never show you enough to serve any practical purpose when you want to check the backside of the tower. This isn't like the shadow of Vincent where he purposely uses low visibility. It just stops halfway blinding you to practical information, like what and where are the blocks back here so that I can create a potentially more efficient path. And God forbid you're left hanging the wrong way. <laughs> I get it. Inverse controls, the real nightmare. <sighs> Thanks, Atlas. If I'm chased by 400 pounds of pussy and ass and get caught by a confusion spell because I was reckless, that was my own fault. But if I'm trying to navigate every feasible option available to me and that I take to shimmying the reverse side of the tower, why am I punished with unintuitive and, dare I say, bad controls? This led to a stupid amount of frustration, rare as it may have been. Even though I inevitably adapted to it, it still left a sour taste in my mouth and I can't say I'm looking forward to dealing with it yet again. Uh, but who the fuck am I kidding? That's not gonna stop me. I'm aware that the full body rendition of the game makes a number of changes, maybe not all for the better, while fixing some of the issues I had, but I'm not sure to what extent beyond that apparently the camera is much more forgiving, letting you tilt it to reveal more of the tower. But maybe I should keep my mouth shut because that would ruin the point of the game. I don't know. Uh, uh, boss? You okay, Tom? Did it hit you yet? That discomfort in the pit of your gut when you realize every god in this game manages to cross the line between being socially acceptable and the grace of a divine being with the elegance of your mother waking up at 3 in the morning to take a piss without shutting the door, disrupting everyone's sleep to the jettison force similar to that of a pressure washer rinsing the shit off the side of your house. I know I kinda just dropped the whole god thing in your lap. Yeah, don't worry. So does Hashino. If only there were some hints. The climax takes the form of a spectacular exposition dump that serves as a series of revelations. Everything from the role Thomas Mutton, aka Dumazid, plays in Astaroth's Game of Nightmares in the name of Ishtar, and other such Phoenician Bronze Age bullshit, to Vincent's hilarious, if not slightly depressing, conditions for how he was born. Oh, wait, they just move on from that detail like it doesn't matter? Well, that just makes it hilarious. Glasses go flying. Fuck you, he keeps crying. The stakes are raised in a do or die fight with the gods. This is just the cutest darn thing. Before we know it, we've reached the end our every action judged accordingly. And by that I mean our position on the meter and a handful of answers we give Astro out during stage 9, but uh, who's keeping count? Lo and behold, the fruit of your labor. Eight endings, each with their own merit as payoff. Even if you manage to achieve the worst variant of order, we still walk away with the knowledge that Catherine views herself as too dull for Vincent's taste, which feeds back into why she clung to the false pregnancy scare in hopes of keeping him, before she knew for certain that he was cheating on her. Landing in the lesser neutral ending shows that Vincent thinks it's better off for him to be single. He can no longer hurt Catherine with a selfish attitude, even if he does still carry a torch for her. Something we only find out when we learn that Johnny tried to swoop in with a rebound, but got trampled like the human doormat that he is. Or, my personal favorite as I mentioned earlier, True Cheater, who plays off the fact that Vincent's an unstoppable force. It only stands to reason that someone who can conquer a god at their own game would manage to dominate the underworld, not to mention while reaching new heights of badass demonic design, while plowing his woman and swooning a flock of demon pussy atop the back of Nergal, plenipotentiary of the underworld aka Catherine's dad. Look at Nergal taking it like a champ. You're wonderful. And being the sucker for sweet things that I am, True Order can still warm my heart after all these years. I mean, hey, if Xenoblade 2 can make me cry like a bitch, it should come as no surprise that I get a little choked up in seeing Vincent learn from his nightmarish ordeal and better himself. Especially for his own sake and that of Catherine. Even if some of his dialogue comes off as corny. But hey, that's romance. There's no getting around it. And that only makes me appreciate it even more so. His actions to mend things with Catherine have a rippling effect, reaching so far as to shine a ray of hope over Orlando's future. But this ending carries with it a revelation that sparked a reasonable controversy. Erica's past. The key word here is reasonable. It's not hard to understand why one would be offended by the way she's treated. After all, I've always been of the opinion that art is meant to provoke an emotional response. It's what makes criticism a necessary byproduct. Hell, even I agree that some of the things I say about her are fucked up. But if I'm being honest, I don't think it comes from a place of ill intent. It's worth considering who it is that speak these words. Vince and his crew, all of which who are friends of Erica, though, they're vultures by nature. They affectionately pick each other apart over flaws, quirks, let alone something as innocuous as age. And yet, in spite of this, they still frequently express concern for Erica, not to mention they're too busy sabotaging their own lives to sabotage what's going on between her and Toby. That's not to say I know for certain that this is the case. For all I know, Hashino is using these characters as a mouthpiece for his own faults. I mean, to poke holes in my own argument. I do think Erica sharing in the same nightmares as other men who are holding back the population count is pretty damn suspect. 
from what I hear, Full Body takes a few steps forward and back in regards to Erika and the subject as a whole, but that at least shows it's something Hashino is consciously aware of. I prefer to give the guy more credit than to assume the worst of him. After all, I could just take the easy way out and dismiss the nuance by claiming that Catherine has a flat understanding of gender, love, and lust. But I don't honestly believe that. But hey, that's just my two cents. This isn't a hill I'm gonna die on. You're more than welcome to disagree. Just about the only thing I'll fight you on is Erica's color palette. And coming back to Catherine after all these years, I decided it was finally time to hear out the Japanese cast. There is a connection here. A heightened sense of being and reality as I transcended my physical form and drifted into a plump bosom of fatless. It's refined dialect supporting my galactic brain like a pillow of tongues that massaged my ears. It was then that I realized only Japan could ever truly accept me. Honestly, I just wanted a break from Troy Baker. Nothing against the guy. He's got the talent and highly sought after for a good reason. Even at the expense of suiting the character. But I still wanted to compare and contrast the voice quality, so I reserved the English voice acting for the follow-up playthrough. And with the blessed talent of Spike fucking Spiegel and Sailor fucking Moon, it comes as no surprise that the Japanese audio is a smooth and cozy listen. Unfortunately, for whatever bizarre reason, some lines go entirely untranslated, such as Astaroth's remarks before and after a stage. Even some of the dialogue outside the nightmare is left without a subtrack. They're missing from the English track as well, but at least the cast is every bit as well suited for the corresponding roles and Michelle Ruff is fantastic. It's beyond me then as to why everyone's mic peaks with a distracting hiss. You think you look good in those? What's this about? Why are you bringing up this Steve guy out of the blue? It's honestly a pretty steep drop in quality, even if it only affects the in-game cutscenes. And it only stands out more that it isn't an issue with the Japanese track. But hey, at least these characters are portrayed with a consistency between both languages. So, you know, counting my blessings. And yet, with how much I'm gushing about it, Catherine still isn't something I'd easily recommend. Adequated to the likes of Shenmue, or Astral Chain, I live for this kind of shit. But maybe you won't fare well when the game begins to test your patience. Which it will. Maybe it's not balanced in such a way that you can tolerate its particular brand of non-traditional bullshit. But then again, maybe you have an interest in Atlas's work, or the idea of something Persona adjacent. Games that unapologetically fulfill their vision despite their flaws. Or hell, maybe even it's something as simple as the concept of a narrative heavy action platformer that entices you. Eh, if that's the case, you never needed my recommendation one way or the other. And if it winds up being to your liking, congratulations, you got good taste. <laughs> Also, I'd like to apologize for the visual quality of my RE2 video. I'm pretty sure the brightness and color settings I recorded the game with was the cause of the final upload being smeared in artifacts. It can be a bit of a mess at times, and I wish I handled that better. I even fucked up the frame rate and uploaded the first version in 30 FPS. I had to remedy that shit right away. Yeah, that's right, I said I would keep the first variant. There it is. The comments were just getting me all warm and gooey on the inside, I had to keep them. Oh yeah, new Twitter. Let's give that another shot.